Uh, I'm Hal Bailey, and uh, I am the provost and academic vice president. I'd like to welcome you to the university. Uh, that uh, introduction was for the two or three people that don't know who I am who are in this audience. Uh, it is a great pleasure and privilege for the university to be able to welcome Senator Bob Casey. Uh, he is fresh back from uh, uh, Pakistan and Iraq, and will be offering uh, some remarks on the, uh, uh, the consequences and insights that he uh, uh, discovered during his trip. Uh, just a little background on the senator before we get, uh, I give the podium over to him. Uh, he is, of course, a neighbor. He originates in Green Ridge and is now the second illustrious people, a person to live in a lovely house up in the hill section. Uh, he is the former Auditor General of the state of Pennsylvania, was elected to the U.S. Senate in 2006. Uh, he's made uh, a, a, a career of concern with public service. Uh, and that has come to uh, a, a really nice situation now with his uh, service as, as senator. Uh, he is currently the chair of the subcommittee on Near Eastern and South and Central Asian Affairs of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. I define any, defy anyone to come up with an acronym for that. Uh, and is, it is his committee that has jurisdiction over Pakistan and Afghanistan. He has just returned, as I said, from a congressional delegation to Iraq and Pakistan, uh, I'm sorry, to Afghanistan and Pakistan, and is going to uh, now offer a few remarks on his trip. Uh, after his remarks, he will be happy to entertain questions regarding uh, the, that issue, the, the Afghanistan and Pakistan trip that he's returning from, and, uh, you know, would like to enter into actually a conversation with you uh, over those issues. So without further ado, it's a great privilege to uh, present to you Senator Bob Casey. Well, thank you very much. I'm really honored to be here today and that uh, so many people came out on, a sh on short notice to hear about our trip. but. I want to fully explain what uh, Dr. Bailey just said. Hal Bailey <laughs> and his wife Paula, this is true, own the house that Teresa and I and our daughters live in. And I always feel a little bit guilty when I see Hal because he was really handy around the house. <laughs> I mean, literally, he, he could fix things. He, he did a lot of painting. I mean, he did really in, even more intricate things than that. I do none of that. <laughs> so whenever I see Hal, I'm, I'm, I feel inadequate at least in that way, and maybe some others as well. But uh, Hal, thank I, you. I the house, it. the house is in good shape. Um, I cut uh, the grass yet last night, literally almost last night. The sun was going down, so I got the front yard done. I'd urge you to avoid the backyard if you want to inspect it. Yeah. <laughs> but Hal, it's, it's uh, great, great to be here with you again, and thank you for your uh, willingness to uh, to kick our program off. I'm grateful and grateful for your work here at the university. I want to as well thank uh, Father Pilars, who I know is not with us today. He's on the road doing his job, but uh, we're grateful that uh, he allowed us this opportunity. In addition to, uh, to Pat Leahy and, and others who, who made, this, uh, made this visit possible. I'm grateful for the chance to talk about uh, the time that I spent uh, in both Afghanistan and Pakistan. Really, and it, it, we were on, gone about six days, I guess, and uh, two days on either end, a little more than probably 24 hours in each um, time segment, is travel. So literally, you're talking about being on the ground two days in Afghanistan, one day in Pakistan, but that takes a while to get, uh, to get there and to get back. A lot happening, obviously, and I've got a lot of, a lot of notes here. Don't worry, I won't read all this, but I'll try to to highlight it as best I can and then leave uh, as much time as possible for, for questions. Uh, it just so happened that when we arrived in Afghanistan that uh, the presidential election had just transpired uh, a day or, I guess I'm forgetting my days now, but a day or so earlier. And um, uh, there's a lot to talk about with regard to the, the uh, presidential election in Afghanistan. Um, but I'll shorten it by saying a couple things. One is we don't really know the results yet. We know some preliminary results. Um, 
10 percent of the vote came in, maybe certainly a little more than that since uh, by now. But it may be weeks before we know for sure whether Hamid Karzai, the current president, has been reelected or not, or whether or not he will have to go through a runoff election, which will take weeks. Um, and we'll talk more about that, but I don't have any breaking news that, that uh, relates to the uh, result of the election. But I can say that we, we were provided a, uh, a briefing uh, about the election, which was helpful. But I think one of the, the most uh, poignant things that I saw, and actually this was on the way over, was, was uh, what it meant for the people of, of uh, Afghanistan and what it means for, for us as well. You know, in this country, we, we have such uh, respect for, uh, even though our, our voter turnout numbers don't always indicate that, but those who are voting in this country year after year, in some cases decade after decade, and in Lackawanna County, we have a lot of people who have done that. People have never missed a vote in their entire lives. Uh, and sometimes when we vote, we, uh, especially for older citizens, it's, it's a challenge. You've got to get there, and sometimes getting there is difficult. Uh, Sometimes if the weather is really bad, there are all kinds of obstacles in your way to voting. And, uh, and I admire people who year after year overcome those obstacles. Sometimes it's difficult to get away from, from work to, to vote. So for some people, it's a challenge just to vote in the United States of America. For many of us, it's not much of a challenge. If we don't do it, we should be ashamed, uh, especially when we don't have impediments in our way. For uh, the people of Afghanistan for this presidential election, in addition to other uh, obstacles in voting, their, their very security was one of those obstacles. They were threatened time and again by the Taliban and by others, but especially the Taliban, that if they voted, something would happen. They would be killed or they'd be injured or they'd, something would happen to them, which is uh, pretty graphic. So despite all of that, you had uh, we, and we don't know the total number yet, but potentially millions and millions of people in that country who voted. And one of the, the most poignant references to that was, this was in uh, the New York Times of uh, August 21st, and I was reading this on the way over. But here's a, a description of a, uh, of a woman who had gone to vote, uh, and she, she was, uh, <clears throat> this was in, in western Kabul, the, the capital city, um, she was asked, um, uh, why should we, oh, sh she said, in, in fact, uh, why should we be scared? Uh, and she, she's uh, a mother of four who brought her daughter and nieces to vote. And it goes on to say, like, like many Afghans, she has only one name. She said, and I quote, we came to have a say in our future and for our children. That's, that's what she said. Now, if, you're, if you happen to be a woman in Afghanistan, you're, you're doubly uh, threatened. Uh, so just the fact that she, she and so many like her overcame all those obstacles uh, to vote, including her own security, tells us a lot about what is at stake there, tells us a lot about uh, the character of the people uh, in that country who are trying to find their way just to cast a vote let alone make a living and live with all of the security threats. So there's, there's still a long way to go there and still um, much to work through. Uh, all kinds of allegations, which I think unfortunately will be more than, when it's documented, more than allegations. The reality of fraud, the reality of uh, uh, interference with, with people's right to vote. But we don't know the result of it yet, and I don't want to pretend to, to be able to summarize it. But Something as simple as literacy, it's hard for us to comprehend this, but something as simple as, as the literacy of a voter uh, is at stake in, in places like Afghanistan. For example, and I had, hadn't thought about this before we were getting our briefing, um, th they were able to, to tell us that uh, for, for many, if not most of the people who are voting in Afghanistan, uh, they're not able to read or in any way determine what's on the ballot if it were just printed words like our ballot. And they gave us a copy. It, this is just a, a long a sheet of paper, and you can't necessarily see it from your seats, but I'll try to describe it for you, where they have, the, they have a, an entry for a candidate, and they literally have a picture of the candidate. Uh, and then whatever information they can provide. But 
that's literally how they have to, both a picture of the candidate and a symbol of what that candidate stands for, the, the party or the philosophy. So they literally, because of the, because of the literacy rates, have to be able to uh, put a picture of the candidate up. So we have a long uh, wait, I think, to find out the, the definitive result. And there are obviously ramifications uh, based upon that result. If, if um, President Karzai is the winner by a small uh, percent of the vote, and then you juxtapose that with all of the, all of the irregularities and fraud that, that are alleged, you could have a very uh, difficult situation where, where the, the will of the people may have been thwarted or, or uh, the will of the people may not have been carried out. Uh, I had the chance later in our trip to, to vis visit Mr. Abdullah Abdullah, really the same name, using, using uh, first and last name of the same name, same spelling. But he was a very impressive uh, candidate, and I could see why he, he was appealing. He was smart and articulate and had a sense of humor and really seemed to capture the imagination of a lot of the Afghan people. Uh, we had a meeting with um, President Karzai as well, which I'll tell you about, uh, much of which was disappointing to me. Uh, but before I go through kind of the schedule of where, where we were, I, I did want to mention as well, and I, I meant to do this earlier, that uh, today we were supposed to be joined uh, by Sergeant Granville. I don't know if you had a chance to, to talk about him, but he, uh, he's at, at Walter Reed and was hoping to be able to drive from Washington this morning to, to, to be with us. But I wanted to, to commend him for his service to our country and just give you some of, it, some of the background as if you were here, because even though he's not here, we can still commend him for uh, his, his willingness to, to try to be part of this and for his service. Uh, Sergeant Granville uh, enlisted in the Pennsylvania National, Army National Guard in December of 2000. Uh, and I won't read his whole history, but he was deployed in Bosnia in, uh, from May of 2002 to March of 2003. Um, he was deployed as well as in, uh, in Iraq from January of 05 to June of 06, and was also deployed in, in Afghanistan. Um, uh, in December of 2007. He was severely wounded on June 3rd of 2008 uh, from an IED, the improvised explosive device that blows up usually from the, from the ground or from the, the pavement or from a, a path that someone is walking or riding. Um, he was in the, the city of, uh, of Zormat, uh, causing uh, his left leg to be amputated through the knee and multiple fractures uh, to his right leg. Uh, two other soldiers were, uh, were, were part of that uh, horrific incident as well. And now uh, Sergeant Granville is a, uh, on active duty with the Warrior Transition Brigade, brigade at uh, Walter Reed Army Medical Center. And uh, we we're hoping he, he could be with us today, but I look forward to the chance to be able to, to talk to him and to learn from him about his own experiences uh, not just in war, but in particular uh, in Afghanistan. So I wanted to remember him today and, and commend him for, for his service. But I, I wanted to, to just provide a, um, a short review of, of our schedule and then take, uh, take some questions. As I said, I, we had a chance to sit with uh, President Karzai. Now, I had met him uh, in the same place in his... Uh, presidential uh, palace back in May of 2008. And uh, uh, I was hoping that, that uh, even, in the, even in the situation, we were, or the time period we were meeting with him, the aftermath, days or hours after an election, uh, even in the midst of that, that he would be focused on the future and focused on the, on the concerns that we have about what's happening in Afghanistan. And when we had our uh, briefing by General McChrystal, who's head of our, our forces there, as well as others, both military and non-military. One of the real concerns that they have is, is to keep everyone focused, to keep the American people focused on our mission. And part of keeping us focused is making sure that uh, President Karzai and the leadership in Afghanistan do their job. Uh, we're concerned about a couple of basic areas. When the President, our President, President Obama, says that the, the main objective there uh, is, to, is to stop 
uh, the, the, the terrorist network from operating, to disrupt, dismantle, and defeat al-Qaeda, and to, to do that by taking on uh, the Taliban in Afghanistan, as well as making sure that the fight is taking place in, a, a, in a Pakistan. When we talk about that, part of that, the foundation of that, or part of the foundation, I should say, has to be President Karzai doing his job. Because if we're concerned about security uh, and development and anti-corruption, just to name three uh, challenges that we have there, you have to have a president, a leader of that country, who's focused on not just making sure that uh, we're moving to the point where the Afghan army can build itself up to the point where our, our soldiers can step back and leave, and also make sure that the Afghan national police is at a point where they can provide day-to-day -day <coughs> security in the country. That's essential. No government, no country can exist without, without a, de a defense force as well as w without a police force. But in addition to that, we would hope that the, the leader of that country would also be putting in place mechanisms within his government to deliver services. Because if the Taliban are in a particular community, in addition to, to intimidating people, they sometimes try to replicate what a government could do. And by doing that, they, they uh, can create a kind of confidence that the people have. If, if, if someone's providing a security, even if you're intimidated by them, you might tolerate them. So the government has to be able to show it can deliver, literally, deliver services. And thirdly, if, if you're the president of, of uh, a country like Afghanistan, one of the top, or one of the lowest, I should say, of, of the, uh, uh, in terms of poor nations in the world, last check it was somewhere around fifth poorest in the whole world, um, you, you want to be able to, to demonstrate as the leader of that country that you're not allowing anything to come between uh, the government and government services and the people. One of those things which not only comes in, comes in front of but also erodes confidence in the government is corruption. So you would hope that the leader of that country would be concerned about security, concerned about governance and delivering services, and would also be concerned about uh, preventing corruption or mitigating or managing <coughs> corruption as best you can. And uh, when I sat down with President Karzai, because I was leading the delegation, I got to ask my questions first. Senator Brown from Ohio was next to me, and then Congressman Zach Space, also from Ohio, member of the House, was the third questioner. And our ambassador was there, General Eikenberry, who's a distinguished military leader, is now, I think, a very effective ambassador uh, for Afghanistan. But uh, for us in Afghanistan. But they were seated to my right, and President Karzai was t to my left. And the first thing I said to him was, um, uh, I hope in the aftermath of, of this election that you'll respect the process. Some doubts about that. He indicated that he would. Let's see. Let's see what happens the next couple of weeks. But then I, I wanted to move right to the, the questions that a lot of the American people have. And I said, look, Mr. President, we, we're, we're helping. And I said something al along the lines of, of the effort that's being made by General McChrystal and by, by our State Department and so many other parts of our government to get things right there. I said, but um, the patience of the American people is not unlimited or open-ended, that uh, people are very concerned about what's happening uh, w with regard to our forces and w with regard to our resources. And uh, I challenged him. Uh, as respectfully as I could to tell me or to make the case to me as if I were, as if I were a, a constituent in Pennsylvania or here in the United States. Tell me what you're doing along the lines of security, trying to move that forward, but especially tell me about government services. Where have you, you know, how have you progressed on that? What's happening now? What do you hope to do if you're still the president of this country? And what are you doing on corruption uh, in your judicial system? Something we take for granted, having a system. They have a, a very uh, limited uh, ju judicial system and, and one that's, if there is one in a place, it's often badly broken. I have to tell you, his response was, uh, to say it was inadequate and disappointing is an understatement. Uh, I would have thought the president of a country would be able to tell us, if not in every case by a metric or by a number. In other words, when I, when I took over as president of Afghanistan, the situation was this with regard to governance or, or, or uh, uh, government services or corruption or things like that. And here's where we are today, and because I'm going to be, I expect to be uh, reelected, here's where I hope to be. Here's where I hope to be on all of those, all those indicators three years from now, five years from now. 
But he, he didn't tell me that. He, he didn't give me any indication that he had a, a sense of, of knowledge about these problems in his country, that he had a sense of urgency about fixing them or addressing them, and that he had a game plan to get there. So on all those, all those fronts, um, uh, to say that I was disappointed is an understatement. And that's one of the problems we have there, uh, is, is a, a vacuum or a lack of leadership. And right now, in my judgment, he's not providing the kind of leadership that we would hope. Um, we'll see if the, if the results of the election change that, if he's able to get a, a new start and, and, and change that. The, um, two, two things to mention on the positive side of that. That's very negative. I understand that. I'm be, being very blunt here. But on the positive side, American officials, and I was able to somewhat begin to validate this based upon two or three meetings, but American officials have made it clear that his ministry, or, or ministries, I should say, his cabinet, the people that he has appointed to run major government agencies, like their security, uh, like their Minister of Interior, one being in charge of the armed forces, obviously, but the other being in charge of, uh, of the police force, as well as other ministries, apparently are very strong. And I was able to meet with uh, two of his ministers and, and be, I think begin to, uh, to uh, validate that in, in terms of our, our meetings with them. So American officials tell us that despite the shortcomings of President Karzai, that some of which I outlined, and this is my opinion, uh, they didn't express this opinion. I did and I have and will continue to. But despite that, they were very clear that they thought his ministries were led by, by capable people. That no matter who won this election based upon this ballot, that uh, a lot of these presidential candidates would pick the same team, the same ministers. And that's a good sign. The other good sign is that unlike, and this is not a criticism, uh, although I, can, I, could, I probably could make some about the prior administration's dealings or strategy or approach with regard to Afghanistan, you have to understand this, this president, President Karzai, had an every other week video conference with President Bush. So think if you're the ambassador to Afghanistan, the guy we met with, Ambassador Wood at the time back in 08, uh, if you're the ambassador in Afghanistan, you're trying to create some pressure on this president to do the right thing, to have a sense of urgency, to get something done on all these issues. It'd be pretty hard to do that if he's talking to the President of the United States every other week. Kind of, I think, undermined the ambassador, at least made it difficult for him to do his job. President Obama said no more video conferences for President Karzai, which sent him a, a very direct signal that we're not just going to have business as usual. You've got to prove to us that you're going to be a better leader for your country. And what that created, I think, was an opportunity for a a Ambassador Eikenberry, who's one tough, experienced soldier in general, to be able to keep the pressure on uh, President Karzai. And he does it. Meets with him on a regular basis and is very very blunt and direct with him has created that kind of pressure that unfortunately I believe we have to apply to ensure that our interests are, are protected in Afghanistan. The second, and maybe third, but the second element of this is Richard Holbrook. Uh, Secretary of State Clinton, in her wisdom and good judgment, wanted to bring someone into the State Department uh, as, a, as a, as not an ambassador, but as someone who can work with our ambassadors, work with other line people in the State Department to focus principally on two countries, or, or I should say exclusively in this case, on two countries, uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan. And that's what Richard Holbrook uh, brings to that job. And anyone who knows anything about his history knows that uh, if you look at the, the, uh, the work he did in, uh, in Bosnia uh, years ago, putting uh, on the Dayton Accords an incredibly complicated uh, agreement, what he's done over the years as a diplomat uh, has been extraordinary. He's very tough. Uh, he's, he can be very belligerent when he has to be with, with a, a foreign leader, but he can also be very charming and engaging. He is one of those uh, diplomats who has all kinds of skills, but also respects two institutions. And this is very important in foreign policy and, and, and as well as a, a military policy. He, he respects the Congress for a lot of reasons that we have a central role to play in foreign policy and defense, and we're appropriators. He understands that. Uh, Richard Holbrook does. And Richard Holbrook also understands uh, that uh, you not only have to have respect for the military, you have to figure out ways to have the military and the civilian uh, entities working together. So he understands that. So that's a long way of saying that with 
Eikenberry as ambassador and Holbrook uh, representing the State Department, representing the President, uh, I believe there's going to be enormous pressure on Mr. Karzai uh, to, do, to do things the right way uh, every day. So I'm happy about that. Um, in addition to uh, our time with him, President Karzai, we had a great briefing by General McChrystal and the, the, uh, the Deputy Ambassador, the, the Deputy to, uh, to Ambassador Eikenberry. And just a couple of uh, points about that. Um, I was struck by not just reading about it and hearing it, but also getting other independent verification about how well uh, General McChrystal and our, our State Department and USAID and ambassadors and so many other players are working together. There's, an, there's a real genuine, authentic mutual respect between the two. When, when General McChrystal, I have no doubt in saying this, when General McChrystal looks at someone in the State Department, uh, an ambassador or someone at USAID, uh, he sees them as not just an equal but a vital part of the strategy in Afghanistan because if this were just a war, a traditional war, uh, it would be pretty much run by the generals and the military and then we'd be battling as, as, as wars uh, tend, to, uh, tend to play out. Unfortunately, it's more, in some ways more challenging because it's counterinsurgency and, and General McChrystal did a good job of walking through that, it's not a traditional uh, effort at all. It's, in, in counterinsurgency, you've, you've got to be as, as concerned about the non-military aspects as the military. For example, when, when they go in, you know, they describe counterinsurgency by a couple of terms in terms of the, uh, in terms of the, uh, the timeline or the events that are supposed to happen. Clear, hold, and build, or clear, hold, and sustain. Or, or go to a place and stay. Because if our military goes into a community in Afghanistan and clears out the Taliban and has a lot of brutal fighting to do that, they can clear them and push them away. But then what's left? You have a population which has been ravaged by war for generations, which is scared to death because of the, the Taliban and, and other insurgents have, have, have uh, murdered people in their community, have intimidated them, and have told them not to try to uh, not to try to have another way of governance. They've had a justice system, Sharia law, which can be brutal in, in the way, it's, um, the way it's, um, it plays out for people. So you have a very uh, shaken population, is one of the best ways to describe it. And no military can, can help at that point except to provide a security perimeter. But the, one of the most important things that General McChrystal emphasizes is that after the military clears out a place, you have, to be, you have to be able to hold it and then to sustain that effort. And you have to do that through governance and through services and through inspiring confidence. So one of the first things that our, um, uh, our USAID and other officials have to do is to call a meeting in that community of tribal elders or whoever is considered a leader in that community and try to begin to inspire confidence that the United States and other uh, governments are going to help you right now with basic services, whether it's food or sewer or schools or whatever we can, in the next couple of days and weeks. And then to deliver on that promise, very hard to do. But then you have to be able to uh, convince them short term and long term that you're going to be there uh, for uh, a long duration, which has never happened in the past. So they don't, the, the, your credibility, anyone saying that, your credibility level is kind of low when you start that. So General McChrystal, uh, spent a good deal of time talking about the importance of that. He also uh, talked about uh, basic, uh, basic threats that are, that are, the two basic threats in his judgment that threaten Afghanistan. One is the, obviously the insurgency and the terrible threat that that poses to the country. But two is just a crisis in confidence. If you live in a country where there's not only war, but your government isn't really working for you and for your family and for your community, there's a, a real crisis uh, in confidence. So uh, that's, and I was going to talk more about his presentation, but I don't think I have time. Um, let me skip to, um, I mentioned a couple of these other meetings that we had uh, with some of his ministries, uh, but that was, uh, uh, that day ended, the, our first full day ended with uh, a briefing by our, our agricultural experts. One of the most important challenges we have in Afghanistan is through a lot of strategies, 
to, to transition their economy away from poppy, which results in, in uh, the prevalence of, of uh, heroin in the drug trade, which is a, which is a major uh, reality in that country right now, uh, to be able to transition away from poppy as a, as a crop, an agricultural product, to, um, uh, to other products, whether it's wheat or whether it's fruit or nuts, things that they've been known for over history, but those parts of their agricultural economy have been, have been decimated. Just to give you a short-term focus, it's a country of 34 provinces, and according to our, uh, to our uh, uh, civilian personnel there, there are about 18 provinces now that are poppy-free. Good news, but they're probably the easy ones to transition away from. But well, a short-term goal would be to get that from 18 just to 22 provinces that are no longer uh, relying upon that crop. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the, the poppy and a lot of the fighting right now are in the southern uh, provinces in, in both Helmand and uh, Kandahar, and that's where most of the, the, uh, the major fighting is taking place. Um, on, our, on our second day there, we had a chance to be briefed by uh, Brigadier General uh, Nicholson, who commands what's called uh, RC South, Regional Command South, and I wish I should have brought a map, but it's in that area in southern Afghanistan, principally made up of those two big provinces, uh, uh, Kandahar and, and Helmand, which we're hearing a lot about in the news. And one of the ways for, for uh, General Nicholson to, to show us that uh, in, in, a, in a kind of a direct or, or aerial view was to take us on a uh, Black Hawk helicopter. So we get on a helicopter and he was able to, to, uh, to take us above a good portion of both provinces to be able to see it from that uh, from that vantage point. And despite our general impression of and some often the reality of Afghanistan is a very dry, arid place where you see a lot of desert and dirt and not a lot of vegetation. When you see it from the air, you realize uh, how much of that country uh, has productive green uh, arable land that we can that we can uh, use for all kinds of all kinds of crops, but that's uh, sometimes that that's not visible until you're above it in a in a Black Hawk helicopter. I was happy that that in this trip, unlike my trip to uh, Baghdad in 2007, that the Black Hawk helicopter was moving at a reasonable rate of speed, and that we weren't doing avoidance maneuvers over the, over rooftops with body armor and a helmet. In this in this instance, it was a it was. Uh, moving at a reasonable speed at a fairly high altitude. We had body armor on, but we didn't have helmets, so that made it a little easier to, uh, to function. If you've ever had those things on you, they're pretty heavy. Um, but that was it for, for General uh, Nicholson to give us that overview was, was, uh, was very helpful. We went to next into Helmand Province to a so-called PRT, Provisional Reconstruction Team, to get a briefing of that. I won't go through all of it, but Suffice it to say that those teams are every bit as important as a, as a brigade or, a, or a, 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 a part of our military because that is the team that has to go into that community after the bad guys have been cleared out. And they have to be able to deliver uh, very quickly to inspire confidence and then to be able to set forth a, a structure so that people can, at the end of a, uh, several months and certainly at the end of several years, that th that community can, can govern itself. So our people do a great job. They have help from other governments as well. The British, in particular, have been active in this part of the country. Um, and then we m went to see, had a meeting with uh, one of the um, uh, what a, one of the uh, uh, the governors of of the various uh, provinces. In this case, he's probably the best known and someone who really inspires uh, confidence. Governor Mangal, M-A-N-G-A-L. Uh, apparently, he doesn't. President Karzai is not a big fan of his. I won't, I won't uh, speculate on why that is, but uh, he's recognized internationally as, as one of the most competent, effective um, uh, governors in that, uh, uh, in that country, if not the best, because he understands how to govern. He, he's a, a kind of a technocrat in the sense that he, he knows what delivering service is all about. So we were able to spend some time with him and uh, try to recognize him as someone that we have confidence in, because it's very important that our government is sending uh, the right signals. 
Um, I'm going to move quickly and then I'll wrap up because I know there's so much to cover, but move quickly to a, a summary of, of our trip to, to Pakistan. Um, we had just one day uh, because I had to be back here a day early, but um, the first thing we did was get a briefing by our embassy. Uh, ambassador Ann Patterson is the ambassador to Pakistan. I remember meeting her back in 2007 when she came before the Foreign Relations Committee for confirmation. Um, now, General Eikenberry in Afghanistan is about 6'3", and he looks like he could play football f for any team you can think of, and he's a tough general and soldier. That's Afghanistan. Then you go to Pakistan and you meet Ann Patterson, our ambassador. She's about something, five foot something. Um, but uh, other than their, their, uh, their height differential, uh, they're both <laughs> incredibly effective. Ann Patterson is someone who, she grew up in Arkansas, uh, wanted to become a diplomat and, and uh, worked in the State Department for years, worked in counter-narcotics, a very tough area of, of uh, any part of our government, and served, I mean, she served in all kinds of places in the world at the ambassadorial level. She, she was in Colombia, for example, a very tough place for anyone. Talk about a place of, of real security risk. And then she uh, was named by President Bush to be ambassador to Pakistan and is still serving there. Does a great job under the most difficult uh, of circ circumstances. Now, when you get to Pakistan, it's a troubled area of the world. We have layers of concerns there. You have a country that, even though they have a tradition of and the reality of a strong military, unlike, unlike uh, uh, Afghanistan, where we're hoping that they can build their Afghan National Army. In Pakistan, you have a strong army. In fact, the army uh, used to be headed by General Musharraf, who was also the president of the country. So you had a, a complete merging or, or uh, uh, melding of both military and, and government power. It was easier to deal with them in that way. It's very efficient to deal with one person who has control of both. In our country, we have a different tradition, thank God. But because of that history, they have a very strong army to the point where we were going to a, a refugee uh, camp for so-called IDPs, internally displaced persons within Pakistan. Because of the fighting that the government or the army has taken to the Taliban in Pakistan, that created uh, flight in a lot of communities and yet these people didn't have, a, didn't have any place to go. Uh, but in, in, fortunately in Pakistan, the army developed a lot of expertise dealing with refugees when they had their earthquake back in 2005. So the Army was able to, to run uh, a lot of these camps and has done a pretty good job at it. Uh, we'll await the final word from international organizations who are monitoring it, but I saw one of them up close, literally being there in a camp when, when uh, uh, women, young women and older women and uh, men and young children were lined up for services for the, to go to the doctor in a tent, but often an air-conditioned tent, thank God, and with which seem to be uh, good medical care. Babies being born in these camps. Uh, uh, people worried about their own security and their own day-to-day um, -day existence. But uh, the, the, the army in Pakistan has had a lot of experience running those kinds of refugee operations, unlike, uh, unlike Pakistan. So we're able to get a, uh, a sense of that, not just by getting the briefing, but of course taking uh, a helicopter <coughs> um, in this case, it wasn't a Black Hawk. It was, a, it was an old Russian helicopter, which was kind of interesting. But to get to the IDP camp and to see uh, a camp that was still had about 40,000 people in it, but had most of the people already back in their communities. Make two, maybe two or three points about the camps. One is that uh, when you hear these numbers about the number of uh, refugees in Afghanistan, the numbers are extraordinary, over 2 million by some estimates. And we had a, a hearing on this in our subcommittee uh, about a month ago, a little more than a month ago. But when you think of that and you think of camps, you think that all of the two, two million something are in camps. Fortunately, the, uh, the people of Pakistan also developed an expertise and have a tradition um, in, in that country of taking people in. So the estimate is as high as 80 percent or more of the two million some who were internally displaced in the country were brought into people's homes. So the, so the Army, the government, had to deal with just the 20 percent or less uh, for the, in these camps. 
So you had a couple hundred thousand people in camps. I think it was about three, 330 is the number I recall, 330,000 people in the camps, which is a lot. But it could have been a lot worse if uh, the people of Pakistan didn't have that tradition and didn't have that experience with bringing people into their homes. So it's a, a huge problem, but it seems to be moving uh, in the right direction. Uh, I, I would hate to have the same problem transpire in Afghanistan because there you would not have uh, the army that could do the job that the Pakistani army has done in terms of the, the emergency. And you wouldn't have a, you wouldn't have a functioning, enough of a functioning government to be able to do, uh, to do it as well in my, in my judgment. Um, we were able to uh, meet some of the, the Pakistani uh, government officials. Unfortunately, we had a, a meeting set up with um, both the Prime Minister and, and the President, uh, President Zadari and Prime Minister Gilani, both of whom I had met back in May of 08, but they, um, the President at the last minute ended up going to China, had something to do there, so he wasn't waiting around for me, but I'll have to reschedule that. Um, and uh, uh, we didn't get a chance to meet them, but we did have a chance to meet again, as I did before, uh, General Kiani, who's the head of their armed forces, uh, a distinguished uh, a military leader, came out of the army and had a great uh, record. He's the the, uh, ar the chief of staff of the army, but in essence runs uh, most of their, their military operations, or all their military operations. But he's a very capable uh, military leader and uh, spent a lot of time in this country, trained and spent a lot of time at Fort Leavenworth in Kansas, has a great sense of, of the concerns that we have here about what's happening in Pakistan and urging their government to keep the pressure on and keep ta taking the fight uh, to the Taliban. But uh, he, uh, uh, he was trying to give us a sense of what's been happening there on the ground. They've, they've done a great job of, of, uh, of moving forward to, uh, to take on the enemy, the, the, the Pakistani Tal Taliban, uh, while we're fighting a war in Afghanistan against uh, the Taliban in that country, as well as other, as well as other, uh, uh, as well as other insurgents. So, uh, we're, we I think we've made some some good progress in the short term, um, but but we know that uh, prior to uh, General McCri President Obama and and by by extension General McChrystal's new strategy in Afghanistan and a new approach to Pakistan. Uh, especially in the, the, the war effort in Afghanistan, things are moving in the wrong direction rapidly. Some believe it still is. Some believe that even though General McChrystal is on the ground and has been implementing his counterinsurgency strategy, that, we're, uh, that it's rapidly deteriorating. And uh, uh, I know that Admiral Mullen was on the news shows a couple days ago saying, basically saying something like that or very close to that. Uh, but I don't think we'll really know the full answer to that until, uh, and that's why you know, the press will be asking time and again about are you going to support a troop increase or not. Well, we're not going to have a, even have a discussion about that until we hear from, from uh, at least I won't, until I hear from, from General McChrystal because he has to be able to evaluate how his new strategy is being implemented, what success that they're seeing or not, to be able to give us uh, an evaluation. So I'll be looking forward to his um, to his review um, in terms of what's happening on the ground militarily, but also what's happening on the ground with regard to building or rebuilding uh, communities in Afghanistan who have been ravaged by war and poverty and so many other uh, challenges. So we'll, we'll uh, await his report and then we'll have to make determinations about uh, the military strategy going forward. But I have a lot of confidence in his leadership and I also have a lot of confidence in the leadership that President Obama has exhibited along with his team. I can't think of a time in our history where we've had a stronger national defense and foreign policy team, starting with the president, who has enormous uh, experience but also has good judgment. Vice President Biden, goes without saying, has all kinds of experience in foreign policy. Secretary of State Clinton uh, has done more in six months than most secretaries of state do in couple of years, literally. She's been a, uh, immediately a recognized leader and has, had play, play, has played a central role in our, our strategy in a lot of places, but in particular in both 
Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, General Jones, our national security advisor, we don't see him much out front. Former commandant of the Marine Corps, um, experienced uh, diplomat as well. Uh, he's been, been uh, very effective. CENTCOM, which is the military apparatus that, that deals with the whole region, is now headed by General Petraeus. Thank goodness we have him in that position where he can focus on a region and not just his, uh, the responsibilities he did have in, uh, uh, in Iraq. Um, and then finally, the people that we mentioned before, we have uh, uh, good, uh, very effective and capable ambassadors. We've got people like Richard Holbrook, uh, focused on both countries, as well as an extraordinary military. I mean, these, these uh, young people that are serving our country are just uh, spectacular. It's hard. You could, you could go paragraph after, after paragraph in describing their valor, their expertise, their commitment, their courage, their skill. Um, they're an extraordinary fighting force, and uh, we should be very proud of what they're doing. Um, so I think we have a good team on the ground, and uh, both military and non-military, and uh, uh, I think we have a good strategy, but we have to continually monitor it, and we also have to, I believe, when I say we, in this case I mean elected officials, uh, people in the administration, but members of the House and the Senate, we have to be able to demonstrate to the American people by metrics or measurements or, or data, whatever term you want to use, give them progress reports that are very specific about how we're doing. If we do that and we keep and we have a strategy in place uh, to defeat what is a real uh, and, and proximate threat to our security, um, I believe we can be we can be successful. But it's going to be uh, not easy to do in a matter of months or even a year. It's going to be a it's going to be longer than that, in my judgment. So, talked uh, at least ten minutes longer than I should have, but I wanted to take uh, take your questions. Thanks very much, everybody.